Every week I get the question, which one of the major voice assistants do you use in your smart home? And the answer is all of them. Why? So I can tell you which one is best for your home. Hello automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and today I'm going to take the frustration out of automation by helping you choose the voice assistant for your home. Now, this is going to be an extensive video because we are going to explore eight different indices of how the voice assistant not only is a voice assistant, how it performs and where it's best suited, but also the ecosystem that you're kind of buying into when you start to use one of these voice assistant by the end of this I will declare a winner at least in most of the categories and then what I will do is help you decide which one is going to fit into your smart home by kind of laying out a couple of those key points that you would want as a person with a specific voice assistant now in case you don't understand some of the basics you're just getting into the smart home world what is a voice assistant well right now you probably know that Amazon Google and Apple have one and there are a number of others out there as well and we'll see one coming from Samsung here to the North American market but in general what they do is they respond to you after you've woken them up with a specific wake word or a specific sets of, of wake words and then you go ahead you ask your question or you give your command and it responds through the use of different processing power in a lot of cases it is cloud-based uh, processing power that is housed by these companies, Google, Amazon, and Apple. Okay, locating keys. Let me go into a quick breakdown of which of the three voice assistants we're talking about and then kind of just some basic details about them. We'll start with the Google Assistant, which was introduced to the public really in May of 2016 and since then has gone into the Google Home smart speakers, the Google Nest devices as well. This was a Google Home Hub at one point, now it's called the Google Nest Hub, so they're kind of transitioning to the words Google Nest. It's also shown up in everything from the Nest IQ lineup of cameras there and Pixel phones or Android phones in general. Now, not every Android phone has the Google Assistant on board. Google has also partnered with companies like Lenovo and JBL to create smart displays with the Google Assistant on board. And there are other speakers out there as well that have that voice assistant on board. Amazon's voice assistant, who shall not be named because will enrage everyone who has one, was introduced in November 2014 so it's a little bit older than the Google Assistant in terms of its deployment into the public now since that time we have seen a number of Echo speakers so this is an Echo Plus the second generation of those but we had an Echo Plus first generation and there have been Echo Dots Echo uh, shows now so smart displays very similar to what Google has created they also have their Fire TV, Fire TV um, sticks, cubes, and the new Fire tablets as well even have the ability to have Amazon's voice assistant on board. They've also par partnered with companies like Lenovo. We even saw them partner with uh, Fitbit as well to put Amazon's voice assistant in one of the newer watches and then Google bought that. So it'll be very interesting to watch that. But Amazon has partnered very well with a lot of companies to put their voice assistant on just a ton of devices. Apple Siri has a bit of a different past because really it wasn't intended for smart speakers like these products were. It was really intended to start on the Apple iPhone and it did in 2011 with the 4S, the iPhone 4S. And we are all the way into talking about an iPhone 12 or a series of iPhone 12s here in 2020. So it's been here a long time. What's important to know about Siri is while it has had that is also moved into devices like the HomePod and the other thing to understand about that is its intention was much more based on execution of specific things in your life and this is something that holds true still to this day. Either way it is very clear that all three of these companies Google, Amazon and Apple have been gearing up and are in the midst of a battle unlike many that we have seen in the tech industry before. There's been a few examples like that and I'm sure you guys can name a few and you should leave those down below please. 
but this battle is those same three players and this is going to continue for some time. So let's get into some of the indices that we are gonna talk about today. These voice assistants answer all kinds of questions. So that's number one. They are going to answer all kinds of queries, questions, whether it's general search or something more detailed. Now, they're also intended to be conversational and to progress with your questions as you go. So that's kind of the second indice that we are going to talk about today. Number three, they are intended to increase your productivity. So you're not supposed to have to physically do everything. You're not supposed to have to sit on your smartphone necessarily or sit attached to a tablet or a computer. Number four is the fact that they play multimedia and this is a major component, probably the most uh, popular component of any voice assistant at this point. Now the other ones, they control your smart home. This is a big deal and part of that ecosystem that we talked about. Another thing is they help you to communicate with your friends and family and this is something that has been expanding out further and further as we've seen these platforms and the voice assistants mature. Number seven is kind of a divisive topic because they play at this point a major component in terms of privacy in your life and in your smart home at this point. And the last thing we're going to talk about is the fact that they need to work everywhere around the world and for most people around the world. So let's start with our first index to talk about and that is the ability to answer questions. And while multimedia might be the overall most popular thing that people do with the voice assistants, the number two and number six and number eight is different types of questions that you will ask your voice assistant over time. Now, I could sit here and tell you all these different results and show you different results, but I don't need to make this video an hour long. What I'm going to use is from a company called Loop Ventures, and they do a great test biannually, so two times a year here, where they walk through, I think it's 500 questions for each voice assistant, and the results there are really telling for us in a lot of ways. Here are the latest results, and this is from Q2, or the last test in 2019. There'll be some new test results out, but what you need to know is that Google scored 93% accuracy, Siri was second at 83%, and Amazon had accuracy that you could round up to that 80%, so it kind of goes one, two, three there in a row. The details are much more interesting though, and if we get into just the first index here, basic informational questions, you can see that Siri takes a pretty hard hit here. And this explains a lot of the public opinion of Siri and why people maybe don't think of that as the second most accurate voice assistant overall. What's happening here is, remember, they're more intended to execute things within your life. The next thing you might look at is navigation. And this is where Siri returns to that execution capability and moves up to second very close to Google who is clearly running away with this. Now, one thing you might expect is that Amazon would do very well in commerce and selling you items, but the questions that they use are about general things and not just trying to buy something off of Amazon. So what happens is Amazon falls off as a result of that here. So if it's not being sold on Amazon, well, then Amazon's going to struggle a little bit there. But here's the basic thing you should be getting from all of this. I mean, we're talking talking about the lowest number here from Amazon being 80% accurate in 500 questions. And again, the details get a little bit more interesting and Amazon does great in general everyday things. So it really depends what you're after in terms of in getting accuracy from your voice assistant. Right now, Google is far and away the leader and they definitely win this category in terms of being able to answer your everyday questions. They have so many different services to pull from. If you think about all of the different Google services from news, finance, their weather services, Google search in general, their ability to pull 
all of that information together from a cloud service perspective, which is what the Google Assistant is, is uh, pulling from, is this cloud service. They're able to pull just a wealth of knowledge and they own most of the world's surf tra search traffic. So they are clearly far and away the best in this category. But in general, Siri is second and it, it really comes down to between Amazon and Siri, do you want to be able to get more things like navigation and get to different businesses. That's where Amazon falls down. Find information about products, get to information about products. Again, Amazon's kind of falling down there and this is where Siri tends to shine. What's going to become more and more important is our second indice here and that is the ability for these voice assistants to be conversational with us. And we saw little features come here and there from Google Assistant and Amazon on uh, their voice assistant in terms of being able to just continue down a thread. So they called it continued conversations over here. And Amazon has their own mode where you can just, without saying the wake word continually again and again, continue with their follow-up mode to ask follow-up questions. But there's a whole other level that is coming to these voice assistants in terms of their conversational capability. And I'm going to back, go back a couple of years at this point and go back to Google I.O. where we witnessed the Google Assistant actually making a phone call, being extremely conversational to the point where the person did not know who was answering the phone, that it was a Google Assistant trying to make an appointment. And we saw this multiple times during that Google I.O. The very next year, we also saw Google come out with a different style of conversational capability with their Pixel devices. The squeeze to talk starts an interaction and or you can use the wake word there for their voice assistant and then you can start a whole thread within their their Pixel devices and I'm sure soon to be their Google Nest devices, their smart speakers and smart displays where you can move so quickly through a number of tasks and a number of different searches for yourself. Recent improvements have seen the ability for Google Assistant to remember different places and people and keep different things within its memory to remind you about different events like birthdays. You can also have them remember addresses and then it becomes a conversational piece of now how do I get to grandma's house instead of how do I get to and the address that you have to remember. So there's a whole different layer that Google is putting into this and really it's based on some of the technologies that they have developed. And that technology is what they call their own natural language processing and this helps them not only internationally but also with all of the processing behind uh, understanding what you're saying and then responding with the appropriate emotion emotions and behavior and that's some of the things that they are talking about as we go forward. Emotions responding with that emotion and giving you a whole different level of conversational capability. Now moving over to Amazon, they have built in a very different way and they're building with the power of many instead of kind of doing everything just in-house. And what I'd say is Amazon has done remarkably well at creating partnerships and then finding acquisition opportunities like uh, great business does and this is what Amazon has been an exceptionally adept at in the last couple of years to advance their language processing capability. A great example is actually a recent chatbot uh, competition that I showed on the channel and this is them trying to give companies the ability to produce great uh, conversational capabilities and then showcase it and then look at ways to work together and to modify and improve Amazon's voice assistant. So this is a very consistent thing they're doing. Let's chat. Welcome to the Alexa Prize, a university competition to advance AI. Hi, this is an Alexa Prize social bot. I don't think we have been properly introduced. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking with? Brian. Hey Brian, it's an enormous pleasure to meet you. Have we chatted already? I'm not sure. Nope, this is our first time. I'm happy that you're back. How is it going? <laughs> uh, good, thanks. How are you? Well, 
I'm always busy as people keep chatting with me all the time. One specific thing that has been so important to Amazon's success in terms of expanding out, understanding dialects, understanding different languages is what they call Clio. And Clio is essentially a skill that has been deployed in some countries. India is a great example where they are deploying that skill in order to learn a number of different dialects and the different languages that they need to within that country and to go and develop that conversational capability with the people that speak those languages and dialects. Apple has made incredible strides and they have a similar growth pattern to uh, Google as well, but they're also not afraid to go out and acquire someone to improve themselves as well. I mean, none of these companies are, but what has happened is their machine learning capabilities have significantly increased since 2017. They've been showing that growth. They actually have a remarkable blog that you can sit and and read through and you won't understand a tenth of what they're saying but really as they move from iOS 10 to 11 they made some specific adjustments that will really help Siri going forward so they move from something called hidden Markov models to deep mixture density networks and so they call them MDN and this has really improved the conversational capability of Siri and it has improved the learning capabilities of Siri as they go forward so as they get more and more more data this movement has allowed them and and they ran into a real privacy snare like all of these companies did just uh, about a year ago now when that occurred they all kind of had to stop handing their data to contractors to review and then uh, go ahead and make adjustments or input information into their data models for these voice assistants or at least Apple stopped that practice right away and this capability or this understanding of machine learning and these different types of networks to help the voice assistant grow and change this has really enabled them to stop that practice, put it on hold at the very least. And I would say that with Siri, I have noticed this distinct improvement, especially from about the middle of 2018 to current times. I mean, this has really changed and that's where Siri moved in terms of just basic information and responding appropriately to questions. That's where they started to move ahead of other players in the industry. When you get right down to it though, Right now, I think the most natural conversational voice assistant is the Google Assistant. So again, their power as a software-based company puts them first here. If you're not saving time with a voice assistant, then I have to ask what you're doing in general. And the productivity options are a place where you start to get into some of that ecosystem that each of these voice assistants give you an entry point into. Now, in this case, we're going to start with Amazon and their productivity options. As long as I've had an Echo device, I've been able to create lists, uh, custom lists, no less, and I can manage my shopping list and a to-do list that they give you basic uh, right off the bat there, but I can also go ahead and create customized lists. Now, this has come out to the other voice assistants as of late, but Amazon has had this for a long time and they've been very adept at managing those lists even to the point where you can go on one of their smart displays and tap to remove uh, an item from any of the lists. Now, they also have ha always had reminders, timers, and alarms, or at least as long as I've had these devices in my home. That's a few years at this point. And all of those things work great. They give you the reminders when you need to, and they have started to give you the ability to trigger reminders based on other uh, actions happening in your smart home, which we'll get more in detail on as we go. But in general, you can get reminders from different sensors and different skills within the Amazon Voice Assistant ecosystem. Their new note system or new notes feature, this is relatively new. It has the ability to take a note, so you can ask it to remember something or take a note that this has happened. And then you can also recall those and it can be based on what is almost like a search with Amazon's Voice Assistant. So you can ask about any note or any item that has X in the title. What do you remember about my dad? Here's what I found. Dad likes to eat. My dad is a poopoo stickle butt. My dad likes to eat poop. 
My dad likes to sniff butts. My dad is a poo poo gingerbread man. My dad's a poo poo face. My dad watches his hands with poop. My dad likes the karate chop poop. My dad is a poo poo face with poo poo's button. My dad makes me eat gross foods. Did that answer your question? Amazon also has the ability to integrate with three different email and calendar clients. And this is a really important component that I think people undervalue a lot in, uh, in reviews of these devices. Because with Google or Apple, you only really have the ability to integrate with their calendar and their email system. And Amazon's giving you access to Google's. Apple's and Microsoft system in order to manage your daily life. And as we move into Apple, you know, like I said, they have the custom list feature. Now it's all managed in a reminders application, which I kind of don't get, but it's there and you can create these custom lists and these custom reminders. You have that ability. You have the ability to create emails on the fly, which is exceptionally powerful on an iPhone you have all of the calendar capabilities that you could want, but this is all within iOS and there is zero option for moving over to an Android phone, getting those notifications or dealing with those notifications unless you're going to create some pretty significant workarounds. And Google does a little bit better than this, but they lose some of the functions that Amazon has. I mean, again, the email capability is not there. They only have the one. They also lose some of the basic functions that Amazon has there as well. Their notes taking feature is not yet complete. And uh, to that note, really neither is series. It's not really complete either. You can't go in and pull information out of it. Now, I think both of those companies are working on this, but it's really not there today in a good way. And you kind of get responses back from Google like, yeah, we can't do that now when you ask for, hey, what are my notes about my YouTube channel? You don't really get that. I get that here. Google Assistant can be set up, but not natively as the voice assistant on an iOS smartphone, but you do have access to open the Google Assistant, have that open, and you can go ahead and utilize that on iOS, but it is directly integrated into Android, and that is most of the world's smartphones out there. So you have that ability with Google's Assistant on a smartphone, and that's a really key component to both Apple and, and Google here, is that their voice assistant can be integrated directly or is the native voice assistant to a set of phones that you will probably use on a regular basis. And if you need that, this is a major productivity piece that Amazon really doesn't have. But the reduction in these other productivity capabilities within the voice assistants is something both Apple and Google have to catch up on. So really, in the end here, if you need to have that voice assistant at your fingertips, and I will say it's very useful to have it on your smartphone and to be able to execute all of these different things you want, if you need that or you want that, then you're going to want to go with either Google or Apple depending on the OS that you are comfortable with. But if you don't need that, the actual best productivity options today are still Amazon. The most popular thing these voice assistants do is to play different types of media. Now, that runs the gambit between music, video, podcast, news, books, and more. And if you look at these statistics from voicebot.ai, you can see how important this component is to your voice assistant. Now, all three voice assistants have a free tier of their music service, so Amazon on music has a free tier it is paid for though through ads just like YouTube music which is now being transitioned to from Google Play music and that is obviously on the Google assistant now Apple has a free tier of a different sort there's just a couple of stations really there so it kind of works a little bit different but you have that option and then you have radio stations as well all within the Apple music application now when you go and you compare music services Amazon has more than anyone in the US but as soon as you get outside of the US that number flips and Google has more options in a lot of cases so it kind of matters where you are but in general Amazon has a ton of services but if we're talking about their own branded Amazon music service it's a little bit frustrating and I think that 
this is mostly what Amazon wants you to use and so over time they will continue to push people in that direction and so this is the thing that is the most highly tied to the voice assistant so Amazon music is tiered and this is kind of frustrating to me so you have this base free service that is ad supported then you go up to those of you with an Amazon Prime subscription then you have access to most of the music that they have on their service and then you have to pay more to move up and the same thing holds true when we talk about video services and even the book service you know if you want the audible book service over and above just the uh, ability for Amazon's voice assistant to read you a book well you're going to have to pay extra for that as well so there's a lot of tiering within Amazon services and I think that personally frustrates me I don't know how you feel about having so many subscription services and kind of getting hit a few times here and there but that one kind of bothers me on the Google side what they have done is a little bit different you know they had Google Play Music and that was their initial entry they have Google Books or Play Books is, is what that was called and Play Movies as well and they have really good integration with Netflix as well on most of their services so you have this ability to play from all of those different services there are subscription fees for all of that Google Play Music and now YouTube Music as Play Music turns into that there's a subscription service for that but it is not something that is tiered two and three times to move up they kind of have the free version and then that next version and that I like that model a little bit better here and I'm hoping Google doesn't change that anytime soon now after that really the music services all are pretty much the same I mean Apple music Google music or YouTube music and Amazon's music services as well as the other services that they have access to they really all have the same content you have all the abilities to use the voice assistants in the same way it's really very similar and I'm sure there's some nuance that I'm missing with one of these voice assistants so go ahead leave that down below because it always helps people to read comments like that now what's really important is how many speakers you can play all of this on and how you can hear all of this music and to be honest most of these systems behave in the same way they have an equalizer they give you the ability to control your music or the way it sounds you can play it on multiple speakers at the same time you can enable and disable Bluetooth on these devices and then play from different music services than the ones they have available when we talk about music though the really important component is what you can play it on and I think the difference between all three of these is the low-cost option that both both Google and Amazon have really there's not a low-cost option in terms of being able to connect your TV with uh, Apple's voice assistant there and there's really not a low-cost option in terms of a speaker there's no Apple mini or Apple home mini there's a Google home mini and an echo dot and those prices and though that model of speaker gives people the opportunity to have a lot of speakers throughout their home that are pretty good at this point for the price point and also for the different capabilities that you get the other thing is they have the ability to connect to your TVs and then use your TVs within those multi speaker audio systems that these Google and Amazon can produce with their voice assistant and with their capability Now from Apple side, the HomePod obviously is a remarkable speaker. It is definitely the best speaker I've had in my home in a long time. And their AirPlay 2 continues to get rolled out to more and more television sets, more and more speakers, and it's giving them more capabilities and more abilities to stream that music content that they give you access to. But they are still lagging behind in that low cost option and this makes it really difficult for people to create 
create those whole home audio systems without spending a ton. But where it really starts to separate is in terms of video. And that's just because these companies all do things very differently in video and they have access to different things on video. Now, we talked about Google's Chromecast and that gives you the ability to stream not only from the voice control interface, but from your smartphone as an interface. That really becomes your remote and then you can almost cast anything, any sort of source to a Chromecast. So this becomes really powerful for you if you want access to any service and it's also very inexpensive. We're gonna flip that on its head and I'm gonna talk about a ton of new products that work with Amazon's voice assistant as well as a number of new features for you. Thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and today I'm going to take the frustration out of automation by keeping you up to date with Amazon's voice assistant and their entire suite of smart home products. It's a hard thing to keep track. One big thing that Google has done really well with that too is you can transfer. So if you started a video here and you want to transfer it to a Chromecast, you can actually just request that through the voice assistant. So if you're watching a really long YouTube video like this one or a Netflix show and you want to go and transfer that, you can actually just request that and move throughout your home. When we talk about Amazon system, well, what we get is a Fire TV device. They have a stick, they have the stick 4K, they have a cube, now they have sound bars, they have TVs with this service actually embedded in it, and all of this gives you access to a ton of different services and usually their little voice assistant enabled remote. Now, that remote, to be honest, the voice control capability is not that good. Basic service searches can sometimes fail and they just don't have great control of their overall platform with that voice component of the remote but the remote itself is fantastic it still has ended up being my primary streaming method in my smart home in the end. So that's the one I've ended up choosing. There's some little frustrations and uh, you know the home theater component that does make up for a lot. You can pair your speakers with a Fire TV 4K and a, and a Cube and then you have this great home theater system with your smart speakers and they're, they're having this dual purpose. That's great. It makes up for a ton of this but I hate that I am getting ads on almost any video I play. I'm getting an Amazon Prime ad now and uh, a Prime Show ad. So they want me to go and join Prime and make sure I'm on that. And that's starting to get a little bit frustrating. And the in inability to uh, control properly with that voice assistant component of that remote is getting a little bit frustrating as well. <laughs> Matters. Apple has a full service streaming platform as well and it has every bit as good an interface and it's a very clean interface for streaming content. Now on top of that, their device costs a little bit more than a Chromecast or the Fire TV stick, the 4K version. It costs a little more and that's kind of the entry point to get into Apple systems anyways. You're spending a little more. The other thing is the HomePod really doesn't pair that well as a home theater speaker and that's a little bit frustrating but they still have that capability. You're just going to end up fiddling with a few things fairly often with that system. Now we do have to talk about YouTube separately. It's the biggest video platform on the world. There's so much content going up and there is so much content that is being consumed. You're here watching a YouTube video right now. So on that platform there is a real difference and the difference is although Amazon now got a YouTube app on their Fire TV uh, stick and their Fire TV devices and they now have the ability to access a YouTube app on their smart displays it's really not the same experience as it is with Google and Apple really has the same thing on their Apple TV service they have a YouTube app and that app works it's fine it's good but 
it's not a great experience. And I would say that you are bordering on great when you talk about a Google Assistant, a Smart Display, and Chromecast. Any of those devices, as long as you are requesting, say, Automate Your Life's latest video, it's going to show up on whatever device you'd like. And this is a huge benefit. The audiobooks, I think, are still the best when you head over to Amazon. You know what? The Audible books capability is really fantastic being able to hear those and just the ability to have any audio book or any book be read out by Amazon's voice assistant. Google Play Books, Google can do this. They have some audio books that they can read, but they just don't have the breadth of books at this point because Amazon is now the biggest marketplace there. Read one of my audio books. Resuming the call of the wild. Again from its brumal sleep wakens the ferine strain. Now what's funny about multimedia to me in the end is that I'm going to call one of these companies platform agnostic almost and that's a strange thing to be saying about Google. See, once you get into Amazon system you're pretty much stuck in there. You got some choices for music services if you're in the US but as, again as soon as you get out of the US there's nothing there or there's very little there and you're kind of stuck into Amazon system and they want to tear you and they want to pull out a little bit of extra cash every week. Apple's kind of the same thing. It's a walled garden. You're, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, and usually it's a few pounds there. So, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck into those systems. What's strange to say is Google is the more platform agnostic here, and they don't have access to all the different music services, but from a video perspective, well, you have Chromecast and you also have the ability to cast any music or almost any music service onto the different groups and the different uh, speakers you have in there on their system. So Google actually is the better one, I think, for multimedia. When we get into a discussion about smart home control and these voice assistants, well, there's really two components that talk about and the first one is your access to different smart home products that can integrate and interact with these voice assistants. Now, Amazon clearly wins the number games hands down. They have done so much to partner with and to create more and more devices through other companies that integrate with their voice assistant and come into Amazon's voice assistant application. So they definitely have the wealth in terms of numbers. Now, you can kind of take the opposite or, or look at the opposite approach with Apple who really only have a few products that they integrate with within HomeKit and that list is growing it's continually growing but by comparison it's it's an ant to an anthill or or an elephant to an anthill it's just an entirely different approach and what Apple is trying to do is actually give you a very secure smart home solution, whereas Amazon is trying to give you a wealth of choice. And when you go to Google, they kind of split down the middle, although they have a lot more devices than Apple has integrated with their voice assistant, and they're probably a lot closer to Amazon than they are to Apple in their approach. But I would say they kind of split down the middle, and in general, what you're going to find is, while Amazon has more overall devices, there aren't a lot of devices that work with Amazon's voice assistant that don't work with Google's voice assistant that you're going to want and from companies that you've heard of. The bigger conversation around smart home control is more around how it happens with these voice assistants. Now number one obviously you're going to get control through that voice assistant but you also have the ability to control through smart display interfaces or an application and then the third way is more through an automated fashion. From the voice control capability, all three of these perform very well with the devices they have connected. They all perform relatively well. You're not going to be really frustrated with what's going on there. The one thing that I think you will run into with these voice assistants is what commands can I actually give to them? Because 
For example, a robot vacuum oftentimes, especially the more expensive units, have the ability to identify rooms or areas in your home and then only clean those areas and then return to the dock. Well, how do you know if your vacuum can actually, it actually has that command available through the voice assistant? Sometimes you got to do a little bit of research. Now, what I'll say is at least Amazon with their skills library shows you how uh, that can occur. And that skills library, that's where the big power comes from Amazon. Not only do they have smart devices there that you can start the connection process with, but they have a number of services that really dwarf the Amazon or the Google Action library there. Now, Apple only has a few functions and they're really clear about that. They're only going to give you a few commands and they will continue to expand as it is secure and practical to do so. But it's going to work almost every time with Siri again because that is an execution based platform it's intended to do things for you now Google Assistant still has the best accuracy and this relates to their ability to actually understand what you're saying there are times where the Google Assistant reliability kind of falls off there and sometimes a command that you had yesterday it worked yesterday reliably, worked well for a while, suddenly doesn't work, and that might continue for a couple of weeks. So there can be some frustration with Google's platform because they are constantly updating the models and constantly changing how they understand your language and how they respond. Now grouping devices in Amazon's voice assistant application is okay but I would say in general both Apple and Google have done better in terms of within their respective applications giving you control of multiple items at the same time and giving you the ability to see them and this is again true on the smart displays for Google. Now Apple clearly doesn't have a smart display so there's really nothing to talk about there I've been waiting a couple of years now for them to put out basically an iPad version of a smart display like Google and Amazon have but the interface with Google is the best it gives you the best smart home control and it gives you access to a number of functions including things like media right on the device with simple swipe and this follows through with the overall applications and you see this this comparison a lot with Amazon in their application it's basically considered an afterthought the smart home control and the smart home component of Amazon's voice assistant and that's because they're focused heavily on multimedia and productivity and they're doing great with those things their skills library is massive and all of those components feel really strong in Amazon's application but the the smart home control and the smart home devices feels quite clunky it's the same thing on the smart displays it's really not been uh, focused on enough here by Amazon and Google's application although it can be very hard to navigate through at times the settings have moved a lot of times it is still the best application out there the home app is very good as long as you don't have a ton of devices and then it can get clunky and difficult to navigate to but they've done a great job with that interface too but the most important component of home automation is actually automating and this is is where Google falls off and they fall off heavily and this should change in the at the end of Q1 or early into Q2 of 2020 this is the end of the works with Nest program and the beginning or the execution of the works with Google Assistant program now what that means is they will be able to create automated routines that will trigger based off of smart sensors or smart devices in your home but right now you can't do that all you can do is speak a command and have a routine or a set of actions occur with their voice assistant or you can schedule it at a specific time of day now the Google assistant on the phones the pixel phones for example that gives you a little more access to do something from a smarter perspective and I'll give you an example when your alarm goes off you can trigger a Google assistant routine once you have stopped snoozing that alarm Apple's automation capabilities are really interesting to me and I actually had to ask Chris from home kit geek how he was able to do so many different things because I, I really within the home application 
all you get access to are triggers from a few sensor types. And I've really only had a few of those sensor types that were HomeKit capable within that application. And so I could only really trigger off of movement, a time of day, myself arriving or leaving home, and a couple other things. But then the automation options were really good with it. Whatever products I had, I was able to trigger those with those. But you have to kind of get other applications in order to bring HomeKit to its full power, its full potential, where you can bring in all these different sensor types. So it becomes much more complicated and you have to get more in depth with HomeKit. So you have to be ready for a little bit of uh, time to be spent learning how to do this, but you can do it with HomeKit today. And then we get to the granddaddy of them all. And Amazon has had this ability to trigger off of different sensor types, trigger at different times, trigger with your voice, trigger with buttons, trigger with a ton of different things that they have access to within their voice assistant application. And they have had the ability with devices like the Echo Show here to use a Zigbee hub and to therefore use those sensor types even to directly integrate and then execute uh, automation within your smart home for you without the need of another hub. So overall, from a smart home perspective, it is pretty clear Amazon is in the lead. If you want to get in depth, you really enjoy the iOS system and you're okay spending a little more to have these certain products than Apple's a great option but for the highest accuracy Google is the best voice assistant for executing those kinds of commands so it's kind of like talk and then this is the ultimate in terms of execution and Apple splits the difference when we talk about the ability to communicate with friends and family actually all three voice assistants really come out with the same capabilities at the end they all take different approaches but they come out with the same capabilities where the difference starts to be is in accessibility see not only is there going to be a dominant smart speaker in your country from one of these companies but there is also going to be a set of friends and family who have one platform already and a set of friends and family who have another platform and that's going to matter as much as anything to you within this whole system because these systems tend to be relatively closed so google has google duo but that's really only available as a native application on Android. Android. Now you can get the Google Duo application on iOS and that gives you a little more accessibility. Their smart displays and smart speakers can make Google Duo voice calls or uh, audio calls, but their smart displays with a camera, so the Nest Hub Max, can make a video call with that service. You can also call anyone really in your country once you have access to that service in your country by Google and the same holds true with Amazon. But when you want to make video calls, and you want to drop in with friends and family some of these nice features that Amazon's voice assistant have well you're going to need to be calling other people with the same echo devices or Amazon voice assistant devices so it becomes a little bit again closed within there unless you're making a standard phone call which again only available in certain countries the funny thing about Apple Siri and their HomePod is if you have it and it's working in your country the HomePod basically uses your phone to make calls and they obviously have their FaceTime capability that's a very important capability mirrors a lot of what Google Duo and Amazon's video calls can do as well but this is all going through your phone at that point or an iPad and again the one point that really favors Google and Apple is their ability to integrate those voice assistants within their specific phone type so iOS and Android really important again I can squeeze to talk with Android, bring up the Google Assistant, start a Google Duo video or audio call or a phone call all within seconds. And the same holds true with iOS and Siri. One point of accessibility that's really tied to where you are in the world is if you are in the US, well, 70% of the smart speakers that have been sold as of this video, that's our approximate number, have been sold by this company. Now, lots of times a company who buys one Echo device ends up with lots of Echo devices, but that is the case. And so in the US, there's a heavy tilt here. Now, to me, being outside the US, I'm, I'm in Canada. 
Canada, really what was important to me is more the phone capability and having that integration with the voice assistant that allows me to be very consistent. I can make a phone call here just as easy as I can make a phone call with my Pixel phone. And the same held true with the HomePod and with Siri on my iPhone. So this that integration capability is more important to me personally because it keeps me consistent between my smart home and on my smartphone. There's no doubt that voice assistants have opened up Pandora's box in terms of data security and privacy. There is no tech that I can think of that has been as divisive as smart home speakers or smart speakers and these voice assistants and their usage of your data and security and privacy. But this topic's kind of funny to me because in case I, you know, maybe I missed something here, but aren't we all carrying around smartphones and aren't those smartphones tracking us a lot worse than any of these voice assistants ever have? Anyways, it's kind of a silly topic, but I do have to address it eventually here on Automate Your Life. So stay tuned for that because that is the much worse issue within our privacy and security. So anyways, getting back to the voice assistants here, you know, in 2019, all three of Amazon, Apple and Google were caught within a bit of a media storm when it was found out that they were handing off recordings to contract companies or contractors and those contractors were then taking those recordings analyzing listening to them and then feeding data back into what are essentially the voice models so that the voice assistants could understand and respond better since that time they you know they all took different actions or different levels of actions and i think apple suspended the process the other two i don't necessarily think that they've totally stopped and you know we didn't hear what the end of that story was but what they did do is increase some of the transparency of their privacy policies and definitely now you can go and very clearly read that essentially all three of these companies need access to all of the data that they want to get access to in order to provide provide you the services with the voice assistant that you're requesting. And what I mean by that is basically all of the privacy policies say, if you want us to answer a question, we want or need this data. Now, I don't buy it for a second that they actually need to exactly know my lo location all the time in order to tell me how far it is to the nearest Starbucks. I feel like maybe I could say, hey, I'm at the zoo right now, can you tell me where the nearest Starbucks is? I'd be okay doing that and maintaining a little bit of extra privacy or at least having that ability to control that. Now, what they've done right now is essentially, you want it, you bought it, give us the data. So all of these companies are really doing the same thing. I think the difference here that you see is, you know, Apple and Google kind of both said, okay, we need to look at this practice of handing off recordings to contractors. I'm not sure you'd find that Amazon has done that at all. And you can go and correct me if I'm wrong. If there's some kind of statement out there from Amazon that says, no, we're going to change how we handle all of this, let me know. We talked about the drop off of the music services not being available as soon as you got outside the US for Amazon specifically, but this holds true with a lot of their features with the voice assistant. And that's because they are heavily US based as a company. Things like Amazon Guard are not available really outside of the US. There's a couple of countries and the same thing holds true for their blueprints capability, which is the ability to create your own home based skills here very easily, very quickly for people like a babysitter those capabilities aren't available outside of the US really. And those are just a couple of examples that as soon as you end up in a European country, Australia specifically, people from Australia talk to me about how very little their Echo device can do versus the ones here in Canada or the US. And really that drop off is massive. The other thing about Amazon internationally is really they do not have a ton of languages available to them to to have you speak with their voice assistant and you know they really have not kept up with either Google or Amazon and we talked about their ability 
to understand how people were speaking through their very advanced uh, R&D efforts with um, voice recognition and text to speech in terms of returning that speech back to you. So, you know, they are ahead in this game and Google has over 40, uh, 40 different languages that they have access to with the Google Assistant. And it takes time moving from the Google Assistant being able to speak and understand a language to moving on to the Google Home products or the Google Nest products. But they do make that transition over about a year after it shows up on a Google Assistant phone. It can be less, it can be more depending on the language and how similar it is to something else that they already have. But in general, they move pretty quickly to add additional languages. And the same can really be said for Apple, who has added a lot of languages in the last couple of years. Now, Google still has the drop off of skills. When you leave the US, there are people who are still telling me that routines aren't even there in their country still. And those are those uh, smart home routines where you don't even have uh, the ability to trigger off of a sensor. It's just really speak a command and have two or three things execute after that. People in a lot of countries still don't have that continued conversation. I hear that multiple languages. I hear that. But in general, Google actually does move forward with rolling out features in the countries that they start to sell their products in. Apple's kind of funny because they don't have a ton of features, but what they do have tends to be there across the countries that they operate in and that they sell their speaker in. So it's kind of a different thing there. They do what they do really well and they tend to do that everywhere they go. There are still a drop off of some features though with Apple as well. In the end, when you go outside of the US and the UK and Canada can kind of be included in where Amazon has this almost full feature capability then I think you're going to want to look at the Google Assistant. The honest truth there is Google leads in a lot of those countries in terms of smart speaker sales outside of those three countries. They actually do lead in Canada still at this point too. Now you know, the other thing is all those different languages that Google has access to and their accuracy in getting those languages running and up to speed and actually rolled out and being useful for people. That that um, track record of success is, is there. So they've been actually really good there. And I know people are always frustrated. They're always at me about when a feature is coming or when a language is coming. But actually, Google has moved so far in terms of an international capability that they are the best here. Now, I wanna stop there, stop talking about the voice assistants and their ecosystems, and I wanna narrow down on who's going to fit which kind of voice assistant. So this is where I try to kind of profile people that are going to enjoy a certain voice assistant a little bit better. Now, obviously I haven't covered everything with these voice assistants, and quite frankly, you can't. So what, I think you should do is if you have a specific question about a voice assistant, leave it down below. You can also join our community boards at community.automatelife.net. I'll leave that link down below. I always answer all the comments I can on especially videos like this where it is so complex and the world keeps changing too. The world of automation keeps changing. So this is a point in time and things will change over time. I think the first key for deciding which voice assistant you're going to go with is where you live in the world and I think in the US it becomes a really complex discussion there but 70% of the smart speaker sales there being from Amazon kind of point you in a certain direction in a lot of cases but once you leave that it becomes a much stronger case for both Apple and Google's smart speakers and their voice assistants. The Middle East is a great example of somewhere that you're kind of going to be forced into a specific direction. If you want to buy something now, you're kind of stuck with Google Assistant. They've just added a number of 
Middle Eastern countries and Arabic languages here that they are able to integrate with the Google Assistant that will come to the Google Home products over time. I'm already getting questions about that from people in those countries. And the other component of this is understand that it takes a long time for one of these companies to learn a language. So if they already don't have a very heavy presence sitting in your country, learning your language, putting smart speakers out in that market in order to develop the understanding and working with the people there, then it's going to take a very long time for them to come out with a viable product. And we have seen this time and time again with Amazon even with their Clio skill they have struggled to put out new languages for that uh, India marketplace the other thing that I think is really important for you to consider is that security that privacy standpoint how focused you are on that will really push you in a different direction and I think it kind of trends from you know these guys are very secure don't get me wrong but because they have so many different devices that they can integrate with, their platform access is obviously not as tightly controlled as something like Apple has, and where they just have a few of these devices and they used to require hardware in order to join uh, a HomeKit network or a HomeKit smart home. So, you know, they don't require that anymore, but there are tough restrictions there to get into Apple's program, and it has caused them to have a very tightly knit set of products with lesser vulnerabilities then. And then on top of that, I think the responses in terms of that that kind of well we can call it a scandal but that issue last year where they were all sharing recordings with contractors a lot of people were upset and Apple probably took the best reaction I would say or the most aggressive reaction to protect privacy and they have talked more and more about privacy and security now Google I would say again you know what they have been pretty aggressive on that front too and while it might not look like it to a lot of people who just don't like Google as a company and you'll hear this out on the market when you hear Google at any one of their conferences or you see them speak at anything they are talking about securing and protecting privacy and giving people the ability to make choices with not only the products they own but the the privacy choices around those products even the google accounts have been a big deal because you know what, they had the Nest accounts before and a lot of people are upset that they have to go and migrate their Nest accounts, but in the end, that's a lot about security and privacy and you know, the, the Ring service with Amazon here had a lot of issues recently with security and privacy of those cameras and those security systems. So, you know what, Google hasn't really had that with the Nest because they've started to migrate away into Google accounts and into bringing that all into one heavily controlled and highly secure system. The other index that I think is really important is how it fits naturally into your life. Because I can tell you, you're going to use a function a lot, but if you don't listen to music a lot, you're probably not going to use a smart speaker. But one of the really key things I still think is that phone. and. You know, in a lot of cases, if you're an iOS user, then Siri and their voice assistant and their smart home platform and their music services are going to make a lot of sense to you. You can still do it with either Amazon or Google on an iPhone, and I have for many years, but really, it's going to be much more natural for you to start using their voice assistant. That's kind of the point here of them having all their own different sets of products. You kind of buy into one, you end up with a few. Google's the same with Android, and I think it's even stronger that way in some cases with Google and Android. Once you're an Android user, the benefits of starting to use all the different Google services like Google Keep for keeping lists or Google Search all the time or Google Assistant now and you know they have the different play music and YouTube music and YouTube and all of these different services that they give you access to and are starting to really come together in really great ways I think pushes you into this and I really do think that that smartphone can drive a lot of this decision for you and then we get to where Amazon really 
has become the choice in the US, UK, and to some extent in Canada here. And that's because they give you the most options and the most capability from their platform right now in terms of just being able to automate your life, bring some productivity to your life. They really have done that and they've made it very, very easy. And that is Amazon. So if you're in one of those countries, you're looking for something really easy to start out, you go out, you get an Echo Dot and a Fire TV stick and you go get the 4K version right off the bat, spend the extra $10 go get those two things it's a great start for a lot of people in those countries so there you have it guys that is actually the end of this video now what I think you want to do now that you're starting to kind of focus on one of these is look at some of our smart home news these are the most recent videos where we'll go through the new features that these companies are bringing out we will showcase them we'll show you how to use them and we'll also tell you about things that haven't even shown up yet here on automate your life so go ahead watch those otherwise guys of course thanks for watching this very long video and of course don't hate automate